Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. So Tamara, let me ask you this. Is there something that you think is really important for the betrayed partner to know? Yes. Sometimes I think that when we're in these, when uh, our clients are in these relationships, that their emotional self-worth uh, erodes. And what I want them to do is to know is to reconnect with your worth and know that agency is your superpower. You can choose how you respond and you can choose your actions. And when you do that in a healthy emotional way, agency is your superpower. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Jake Porter. I'm so grateful you have tuned in today for what's gonna be a really important, um, but also potentially um, powerful and uncomfortable and difficult conversation. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the subject of emotional abuse. Um, that is a phrase that I've been hearing more and more in the context of working with partners who've been betrayed, a phrase that I've heard more and more that uh, partners are identifying with to describe their experience of being partnered with a sex addict or a chronic betrayer. And so uh, today I'm going to be joined by a, an APSATS coach working on her certification. Her name is Tamara Litchfield. She is a betrayal trauma life coach with Becoming Shatterproof LLC. She's a wife of 19 and a half years, a mom of three children ranging in ages from 18 to six years old. And um, she and I are going to have a discussion about um, this this idea of emotional abuse and how it factors in, how it fits in to conversations and understanding the experience of betrayal, and particularly when there is problematic sexual behavior on board and when the one who did the betraying is attempting to get into recovery and restore the relationship. So again, this conversation, I think it's important. This is something that, I, I again, I'm, I'm hearing it more and more. Uh, coming up with clients. And I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding going on uh, that can be harmful, not just to betrayed partners, but also to the ones who do the betraying into their relationships. And that can happen on both ends. Those who reject entirely this idea that there could be abuse happening in cases of problematic sexual behavior and those who want to see it completely and entirely only through the lens of abuse. And so I hope that this is a helpful conversation for all of you as you seek to sort of find your own story and, and find words and concepts that help you to better understand it and articulate it both to yourselves and to others. So sit back, tune in. And, uh, and and enjoy this conversation with Tamara. Before I jump over there, though, I do just want to say a word. If you're listening to this podcast and you are unfamiliar with AppSats, I just want to very quickly tell you a little bit about the sponsoring organization of this podcast. AppSats is the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists. AppSats uh, is a nonprofit that exists to advocate for um, partners of sex addicts and betrayed partners and to educate and train uh, professionals to do better work with partners, understanding that often the experience of being a partner of a sex addict or being a partner who has been betrayed is not indicative of co addiction or not indicative of codependency, but it is actually an experience of trauma. And so if you are unfamiliar with APSATS, I really encourage you to check us out. Go to APSATS, A-P-S-A-T-S dot O-R-G and learn more. All right, here we go. I hope that you get a lot out of my conversation with Tamara Litchfield. Well, hello, Tamara. How are you? I'm doing great this morning. Thank you. 
you listen to that massive applause for you. No, thank you for being here on Betrayal Recovery Radio. It is great to have you. I'm really excited about this discussion that we're going to have. And uh, before we get into all the serious stuff, um, so I learned something about you when you were, you know, sharing with me and planning this episode. Uh, we've got some things in common. It sounds like we're both band nerds. That is true. <laughs> yeah. That so you is are. True. You're a flautist, right? I am. I am a flautist. Yes. And I I did that all through, well, I've been playing since I was nine. Uh-huh. And I did that all through um, high school. I have my degree in flute performance from the University wow. of Pacific Conservatory of Music. That's a big deal. I, You know, I just want to say that's, I know how much work that is. I was a music major. I did theory and composition, but my major instrument was bassoon and uh, piano. So, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I love that. Love that we uh, get to share that. Our last guest, actually, her son is in the bands and he's doing Drum Corps International. So we got to kind of geek out on that in the beginning of the I'm episode not, as well. Never been in Drum Corps, but um, yeah. friends that were. Um, so uh-huh. I know I, when she said DCI, I knew exactly what she was talking about. You knew, you knew what Sarah was talking about. That's great. Well, Tamara, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today, and I really am excited about this topic um, on uh, emotional abuse. And so um, you're a coach, you're an APSATS trained coach, you're working toward becoming uh, certified uh, with APSATS, and um, you have your own your own practice there, becoming shatterproof. So I just want to jump in and, um, well, let me tell the audience this first. So Tamara actually emailed me requesting this topic, but suggesting that I talk about it with someone else. And I said, well, why not you? So, so thank you for coming on Tamara. And, um, you know, obviously this is something that means a lot to you. So let's just jump right in. In your mind, uh, how are you defining and how do you define emotional abuse? I feel like emotional abuse is when there's someone that is trying as a means of control, they're do, having certain behaviors that are detrimental. So they might be manipulating or gaslighting or blaming or lying or stonewalling or any of those behaviors. And it's be, a lot of times it's because they're having a hard time controlling their own inner self that they, it's an attempt to control others. Um, and, mm-hmm. and so this has been uh, something that happens when I'm talking with my clients, they're talking to me about their relationships and what's going on. And sometimes this happens, um, even if they're not acting out. Um, th- and a lot of times it's like they've been, and haven't been acting out for long periods of time. And so some people like to call that like the dry drunk. They're still, ha- right. they're, they still have those behaviors that are damaging to the relationship. So, um, so let's, let's get to a little higher resolution here on this. So what are some forms of emotional abuse as, as you understand it? So gaslighting is one. And I know your, your last guest just talked about that and gaslighting. Yes. I don't have her definition, but um, it's basically where it's distorting your reality of what you think is true. You might feel something is true, but you're being told that that's not, and it's not happening. And so it, it's, will make you second guess your own intuition. Okay. Right. So gaslighting, meaning, um, um, I'm trying to, to convince you of a reality that is not true. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. All right. What else? There's the stonewalling. And oftentimes I hear of this happening when they're, be, they'll be talking to their partner and the, the partner will feel shame and literally walk out of the room without wanting to discuss the topic further. And then there, there'll be no estimated time of when that the partner will be back to talk about it. So it's literally just stonewalling, walks out of the room with no plan of ever returning to resolving the topic. Okay. All right. What else? There's blaming. And blaming is where the spouse or the partner will blame the other's partner. I would have done this. I wouldn't have done this if you had done why. And so blaming the partner for their behavior. Right. 
Right. And that's when I when I'm working with uh, couples, I often see that um, the, the one who has done the betrayal or who has the problematic sexual behavior, they often um, have cause and effect reversed in their <laughs> in their minds. Right. So, well, I act this way because you, you know, are angry all the time. <laughs> well, maybe your partner's angry all the time because you're acting this way. So, uh, you know, yeah. OK, what else? What else you got on that list? What else? Um, what's another? There's another big one is the lying, is the deceiving mm. where and even when they're lying, when they don't have to. Um, another one is where I mean, even a simple thing as having their phone in their hand and turning the phone away. That's a form of deception where it's like, wait, what's going on? That that behavior, does you don't need to turn your phone away. That's that's going to be. That's problematic mm -hmm. because that it has a potential to cause some trauma triggers to go crazy. Sure, sure. Now, I'm just imagining some listeners going, okay, come on, hold on, Jake, hold on, Tamara. So you're saying if I turn my phone away, that's emotional abuse. What would you say to that? I would say it depends on what your intent is. Ah. But what, what is the intent? Your impact your impact, you can't control the impact of your behaviors. So your intent might not to be to harm. And in fact, I think that most of the people were, you know, that what we're talking about, most people are not trying to hurt. I don't, I don't believe yeah. that most people are trying to, I, I believe the best in people. Um, yeah. But the impact is what is, is so damaging. Yeah. So a couple of things I'm hearing in what you're saying there that I think are really important to point out. One thing I think I hear you saying, so correct me if I'm wrong, but is that while something like turning your phone away, uh, deception could be abusive, it, it may not be, That's you know, true. like, so, so it, so maybe, um, it would be fair to say something like, you know, um, deception is not always abuse, but sometimes abuse. Is that That's true? That's correct. That is okay. true. Thank you. And I, I should saying, have speaking universals. No, no, I, no, this is good. This is why we're having this conversation because I think a lot of people are confusing this. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll just share. There's a, there's someone I'm working with right now. And, um, he, from, from, from my, experience and i know i'm getting you know I, I could be getting not the full story I, i'm usually not getting the full story but but he is owning he's very clear he is owning that his behavior had an abusive effect on his wife where the rub is coming in is that his wife is convinced based on some maybe stuff she's read on the internet that he is an abuser and did this on purpose and he's saying Hook me up to any polygraph examiner you want. You know, I promise, you know, I, I see it was damaging, but I never intended to damage. And I heard you use that word earlier, intent. Can yes. you speak to that a little bit, the importance yes. of that? I think that intent, it, it, it basically comes from the heart. So mm. what are we intending to do? Um, I, don't, I, I think that a lot of times these behaviors, they're coping skills, but they're maladaptive. And so I don't think that that the the partners that the, the betrayers that they are intending to hurt us, um, but there are vehicles that they can use or things that they can do to help them be more aware of what yeah. is going on, and the awareness yeah. I think is key for both partners. Right, right, and and you know I, I've I've worked with. Lots and lots of people now, and I would agree that generally speaking, um, the the folks who struggled with problematic sexual behavior, as they start looking at the impact on their relationship and they're owning it, they're they're very devastated. They're grieved when they begin to see the impact it actually had on their partner, and the depth of that grief is because that really wasn't their intent. I will say though, I have worked with people who have some what we would call antisocial sort of traits, uh, more malignant forms of narcissism, where there was intent to to hurt, 
to do harm at times. Maybe not all the time, but and and to me, those are very, very different. Yeah, I would agree with that. I t- completely agree with that. Yeah. So I don't want to move uh, too quickly. We were going through some different forms of emotional abuse, and I was thinking, let's let's maybe slow down a little bit and maybe think of some examples of these. So uh, gaslighting, we talked about pretty well. Uh, stonewalling, you gave a good example there, deception, you know, even hiding the phone. What about criticism? What about const- if it's not, not like a critique, not like, you know, I really like the onions chopped a little bit smaller, uh, you know, here or there, because we want to be able to, to offer things like that to our partners in a healthy relationship. But when does criticism cross the line in your mind? And this is tricky, I think, because criticism can end up being a trigger. So even the, you can chop the onions a little bit um, so, uh, smaller, can end mm-hmm. up being a trigger for someone if they have had that insidious criticism where it's like, you don't know how to raise the kids or you could um, you could dress differently or mm-hmm. you, you didn't lock the door, but you know, you know, these things well, that yeah. just the yeah. simple things and it can be really hurtful too. I mean, the criticism can be uh, biting and super hurtful if they're in that, if they're in the cycle of the addiction cycle where they right. are building up to, to a lot of things that might not be great. And, um, they're building up to acting out, I should say. And, and so it can be, it can be um, rude and, and really hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the things I always uh, say to the, the clients I'm working with is, you know, if you, if you betrayed your partner and if you have engaged in some of these dysfunctional relational patterns in the past, yeah, the goal is that you have a safe enough relationship that you can say to one another, Hey, could the onions be a little smaller or, Hey, I really think, you know, the way you responded to so-and-so was a little harsh. You want to get to the point to say that, but that's, that's something you have to earn by proving yourself a safe person, right? Yes. Um, so that, so that your partner knows that your heart is, is for them and for the relationship and in the right place. And it's, and that the intent, we're coming back to intent again, is not to cut down and harm. Yes. And another thing I wanted to mention is that if there is a strong emotional connection with the partners and something, something is said um, that could seem critical, it doesn't, the impact isn't as great. If they're working on their relationship and both partners are healing, then the impact isn't, isn't so bad. And, you know, like, can you cut the onions or you should cut the onions smaller isn't going to affect them if if they're both working on it and they have that connection and they, they believe that the intent is, is harmless. Right. Yeah. I, I do this whole exercise with couples where we, we kind of map out on, on the whiteboard, we map out their dysfunctional patterns. Right. And, and what we typically find out then is that issue X is never the real issue. Right. So, so if, if you could cut the onions smaller, if that actually causes a trigger, it's not about the onions. Right. Yes. <laughs> but if we're if we're in a secure enough relationship and there's enough sta- safety and and trust there, then that comment can just be about the onions, and it doesn't yes. have all of this history imported into no it. No baggage but, that's in it. If there's, exactly. If, if the you know if you're working from an attachment style, so to speak, you know if you've got mm-hmm. a secure attachment, you're you're it's going to be okay. If you have, but if you have any of the insecure attachment styles avoidant and, or in, um i just lost the thought preoccupied right? preoccupied or yeah. you know any of those insecure yeah. ones it's 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 going to the impact is going to be much greater sure sure and yeah that's that's a good point that's a good point okay how about um manipulation let's let's talk manipulation Manipulation, I see it as a form of control. They're trying to control someone's behavior by manipulating your behavior to get a certain goal. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and here's what, um, again, this, this is one that's tricky in some cases because there are definitely people out there who knowingly and intentionally manipulate. And yet I also know like when I'm doing family of origin work, uh, those, those intensives, I do, you know, four to six times a year, either a group of men or a group of women. And we do this family of origin work. One of the things that we learn is that if you were as a child, if you were a lost child in the family system, uh, meaning, you know, kind of left to yourself, maybe another kid required more attention, more work on the part of the parents and you were the good kid and you did your homework on your own and cleaned your, all of that. Those lost children often grow up to have this very sort of passive, um, subtle form of manipulation, but it comes from them learning in childhood that they can't just ask for their needs and wants to be met. And so rather than just coming out and using their voice, instead what they end up doing, because this was what they learned as a kid, is they have to be sort of side, come out, come at it sideways a little bit, you know, um, suggestive or set things up to get what they want because deep down they are kind of voiceless when it comes to their needs and their wants, or at least they, they, they believe that. So, you know, I just think that's an important thing to consider if you're feeling manipulated. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tamara. Um, I don't have any specific examples. I say it resonates with what I hear from my clients and mm -hmm. um, the, the passive aggressive. Is that what you're describing yeah, but, in a way? Well, yeah, it, it could be passive aggressive. Um, I think manipulation with, with intent, like I'm definitely, like I'm knowingly intentionally manipulating you. That's definitely passive aggressive uh, because manipulation means you're not coming right at it. Right. It's, it's got this subversive sort of element to it, but but if if it is coming from that childhood lost child sort of template for relationships, it's more passive than aggressive, but it's still manipulation. There's not an a there's not an aggressiveness to it. It's more like from a place of feeling run down and and powerless to actually ask for what I need and want. So if I'm going to get my needs met, it's got to be through this sort of backhanded way. That's, that's, that's some of what I've found in working with, with folks. Yes. Um, yeah. So again, I just think it's important, you know, again, the manipulation itself can have an abusive effect, but it's a very different experience internally for, for different people who are doing the manipulation. Yes. I, I think that they are trying to be authentic but without the tools to do so. Oh, sure. That's well said. Well said. How about withholding of affection? Withholding of affection is intentionally um, putting barriers between yourself and your partner mm. and as a form of punishment, very punitive, where the yeah. partner might feel hurt and then they put the put a barrier and like, I will not you know, show affection. But yet you see this when, but, and this might be more of a, a kind of going with silent treatment too, is that they'll withhold, withhold affection from the partner, but yet they will give tons of affection to friends and the children where it's just the partner being isolated. Hmm. Now, now what if I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit? What if uh, it's motivated by fear? And not fear, intent to punish. Fear of intimacy. Or fear, fear of intimacy. Of, fear fear of, of triggering the partner. Fear of doing something wrong. Fear of, here's one that I've heard, and I, I, it's really sad, but guys finally get sober from, you know, sexual acting out, and they're very afraid to lose their sobriety by being sexual in any way, right? So they kind of swing to the other side. What, what do you think about that? Where would that fit in? I think that's a, you, know, you said a protective behavior. And I think if there's communication between the, the spouses or the partners, yes. then that helps to eliminate that withholding of affection. Um, right. Um, thought of that being even abuse. Cause we know the intent, if you understand what's going on, um, 
then that can help clear things up. And sometimes that I think that also help, happens with depression. There's depression oh, yeah. sometimes. People can pull away and detach yeah. and, um, and do that. And sometimes a, um, a partner, a betrayed partner needs to understand it, that it's not about them in many cases yeah it's not, not about them usually not <laughs> yeah. and so yeah. if they can get to a place where they're healing and mm -hmm. they can understand those tools it helps to give a perspective of i can hold space sure I'm able to hold space for that partner yeah. yeah and that is such a such a hard and difficult line to walk you know because even though it may not be about them it's very definitely affecting them and impacting them right and yeah, that's a, that's a hard space to walk in one where, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you're a partner and that's resonating with you, um, support, 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 healthy community, yes. good groups. That is so key in helping to navigate that. Yeah. So navigating this whole road is hard. I mean, we're here in this space and as a coach and your therapist, you know, we're working with partners that are navigating just such rough waters. And I just want to, you know, make that clear. We understand, we understand yeah. it's a hard place. Absolutely. So I'm going to take a little bit of a turn here. So often when we think, um, uh, with compulsive behavior, someone with compulsive behaviors is sober, they think, okay, well, I'm sober now, right? Like, you know, they want to say to their partner or their spouse, you know, their wife, husband, whoever it is, hey, um, I'm sober now, so we're good, right? And and I heard you say earlier that sometimes these things go on even after sobriety. So can you speak to why sobriety in and of itself isn't always enough? Sobriety in and of itself isn't always enough because if they if the behaviors they haven't healed those inner child wounds that you've that you talked about if they're ha they haven't gone down to the core of what is the issue and and the reasons why they chose those behaviors um mm. the acting out behaviors in the first place um then they can be sober but yet those maladaptive coping skills that we just went over um right are present and it becomes like walking on eggshells in, and, the, mm -hmm. and the energy in the house, in the house can be different when you have that because you, you don't want to um, trigger, you know, any of those behaviors. And that's what I've heard yeah. from my clients. Like it's, it's, he's sober, but. Right. But the big, but. The big butt. That's right. Yeah. And, and I mean, one of the things that I ask partners often now, I don't ask this until there are a few months, maybe say post disclosure. Okay. They get down the road a few months post disclosure. Um, and I ask something, something like this. If you could go back and have the exact relationship you had, like every single thing in your marriage, the dynamic between you and your your uh, partner was exactly the same minus the acting out behavior. Would you want that? I have never had a partner say yes. Right. Be nice. and think about it because, because all of a sudden what I see happen often is that the discovery of the betrayal begins to shine a light on all of these other dysfunctional patterns in the relationship and now they don't want any of it. It's not just let's cut out the sexual acting out. They see sort of an environmental context or relational context in which that betrayal thrived. And they're like, no, I'm not going back to that. Yes. If I can relate an ex and uh, experience from clients and yeah. hearing their stories, um, a lot of times I hear, you know, on Discovery Day, but what they thought was, you know, initially they're devastated, right? And then they, they like the next day, they might come to discovery. Okay, so he said he wants to go to a therapist. He said he wants to go to a 12-step group. He said he wants to do this. And they are thinking, okay, not only is that behavior, the acting out behavior going to stop, but he's going to get fixed, so to speak. I hate using the word get fixed. <laughs> No, but, that's what they think. You, that's what you many hear people it all think. All the time, you hear yeah. it all the time. Like, 
th we're going to have, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be, you know, everything's going to be, um, roses and, you know, yeah. it's going to, it's going to be fabulous. And, but and, you know, the reality is re recovery and healing is hard and yeah. it, it, it ebbs and flows and it goes through things and it's, it's bumps and hills and valleys and right. all of that. Right. And addiction, I, I believe most of the time, addiction is a symptom, right, of these other things. Now, it's a symptom that we have to deal with to get to the other things, usually. Um, that's why sobriety, while it's not um, uh, sufficient, it is necessary, right? Uh, not sufficient, but very, very necessary uh, to get to these other things, to get to those core issues. So, so if, if sobriety alone isn't enough, to create safety for the spouse, and we're, we've kind of been talking around this, but I want to I want to talk about it very directly. What what more is necessary? Well, I think what I just said. The, okay, going to counseling, finding a good counselor that not only knows, um, you know, the general therapy can do all of the whatever CBT, whatever you know, EFT, whatever thing that sure does um but also is a csat who's hopefully apsats trained as well and yeah. certified someone that's partner sensitive that will um help them get to the root yeah. of why and help them give them tools to navigate this because change takes time it does it does take time and and just to help uh our listeners you know, I, one, I agree with everything you just said. And, and here's one way to, to maybe interview a therapist or a coach or somebody you're going to work with. You want to understand their philosophy about the relationship between, um, an addict's recovery and the addict's relationship. What's the relationship there? Because, in some older models, more traditional models, a lot, I, I'm a 12 stepper, I'm pro 12 step. And I recognize it's not perfect and has limitations. And one of the limitations sometimes in 12 step, uh, culture is, oh, that's your recovery. You stay on your side of the street. Um, that's her stuff. She's got to do her own work. And, and of course there's a grain of truth in all of that, but it's not complete, right? Because I, I think we can go beyond that. And I can take care of myself and my partner at the same time. And I actually can put the healing of my relationship as an important part of my recovery. And my recovery is an important part of healing the relationship. Those can be combined together. And so um, I just always like to throw that out there when I can, that, that that's something to ask about. Um, because you want a therapist or a coach who's going to help the one who did the betraying figure out how to bridge that recovery work to relational repair work. Super, super important. I like to recommend to my clients um, the help her heal for their husband, if yeah. he's willing, as well mm -hmm. as the help them heal. Yes. Uh, by Carol, coach, coach, Carol, Carol the coach, Carol, Carol Jorgensen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent material. I've got it right back there on my bookshelf. Uh, it's good right stuff. Urkum is uh, her model, early, um, early recovery. recovery couples empathy model, and uh, yeah, it's a great model. Um, and we'll link to that. I'll, I'll I'll be sure and put that in the show notes for people who who are looking for that. But yeah, that's that's a great resource. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this. Let's let's kind of pivot now and talk about partners. How can partners, if, if they're listening to this and they're going, yep, I've, yep, that's me. Yep. I've experienced that. Yep. I've experienced that. How can they respond to these, like you call them maladaptive behaviors that feel, that can really feel abusive? Well, it, here comes the big word boundaries, right? They oh, can, yeah, <laughs> they can <laughs> um, put up both physical and emotional boundaries. Sometimes it requires walking away and saying that we can come back to this at this time. Sometimes it requires uh, more bigger boundaries of this is not acceptable right now at all. And um, this requires a physical boundary that lasts X amount of time. 
um, whatever is whatever she needs to feel emotionally safe in that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give an example of that. Um, actually this happened this morning. So, uh, was doing some consultation work, uh, with, with a guy, his wife, um, uh, actually, I mentioned him earlier in our conversation. His wife is convinced that he intentionally, intentionally uh, was abusive and trying to harm her, trying to to do these things. And he's saying, no, well, I, you know, I don't really know the guy. I've done d- one hour of consultation. But one of her boundaries was that he see, works with a professional trained specifically who specifically understands Uh, emotional abuse as it relates to problematic sexual behavior. And so, you know, I connected him with somebody who I thought might be a good fit for that. And, and I was really proud of him because what he did was he didn't set an appointment with himself. He set an appointment for his wife and this person first. Oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't even coach him to do that. That was pretty good. Taking some accountability. Yeah. Her boundary, taking some accountability and, trying to set them up sounds like it's one of the help them heal yeah. um, situations yeah. An- another thing i wanted to mention on this topic was if it's a if you're physically safe and you're in, and you recognize that there there are some behaviors here that are um it could be described as emotional abuse if it's a safe and you discern that it's okay to mention it you can actually point it out to your partner and just say, did you know that what you're doing is whatever? And a lot of times they don't even realize it. They don't right. even recognize it. And when they, I've heard this from clients that when they do recognize it, they are taken back and the, Oh, I never, that was never my intent. Right. You know, and even, and I've even had um, heard of partners thanking their wives for letting them know what, that was because yeah. they never wanted to be that man. Sure. Sure. Wow. So this, that's those good. Breakthroughs. I like that. And I like the way you did it. Did you know that what you're doing, that's a great way to, I, I, I really like that because what often happens and I understand why there's so much fear and pain and hurt and anger, and there's been injustice and disempowerment that often I think the way it comes out is, you're abusive. <laughs> You're an abuser. And and that's probably not going to get you what you want, <laughs> right? Because now, you know, it's kind of throwing, throwing, throwing some gasoline on there. But, but from that place of empowerment and grounding and saying, asking, did you know that what you're doing is abusive to me? Because awareness is half the battle, honestly, yeah. for, for everybody. It's being aware, you know, it goes into that mindfulness thing, being aware of mm-hmm. what you're doing, of what you're experiencing. Because if you don't know what you're experiencing, you can't heal from it. Kind of goes yeah, like, you know, full right. disclosure. You can't heal from what you don't know. That's, that's true. So let's, let's talk about healing. What, um, what can a person, a partner, a spouse who has that problematic sexual behavior, who has been engaging in these things, what can they do? What are some specific things if they're saying, okay, Tamara, just tell me what to do. Just give me a list. What can they do to begin to correct and heal that damage they've inflicted? Well, we talked about it a little bit, got the awareness, first thing you know, sure. and then you can find a professional that's trained in mm-hmm. um, betrayal trauma specifically, um, um, which then can, they can probably help you find a support group that can get you into. So you then you can learn tools that I like to call you know, tools that help you put on Teflon Mm. so that as you um, are, when you, when you recognize it and you go through it, you can learn how to process those, what's going on. And you can then learn those resiliency skills. You know, some things are as simple as some breathing exercises. Some things are as simple as even doing some, there's a one that has to do with per, your peripheral vision. It helps calm you. Anything that's yeah. going to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, that yeah. is going to help you get to a place where you can process that and get your prefrontal cortex back online. Take right. the amygdala out of it. 
Go ahead. <laughs> so so I, I just want to reflect it back. What I think I hear you saying is basically start with awareness. And then once you have that awareness, now you, you, you catch yourself. You catch yourself when you're going to do one of these things that you've – uh, your your partner has reported to you is uh, is abusive, and you you then do the grounding work, you do the breath work, you do that, and now you got to do something different, right? And and I tell one of the tools that I I use that I think is really helpful is uh, values work to be really clear on my values. What kind of partner do I want to be? How do I want to show up? And I want to I want to have immediate clarity about that. So, so in my life right now, and I think we can change our values in different seasons based on what we're going through and what we need. My values in my life are courage, humility, kindness, and joy. So how do I embody those right now with my, my, my wife? So, so I don't have to let my emotion drive the bus. I don't have to let the old scripts drive the bus. I can, I can consciously choose to show up in a way that is, courageous, kind, humble, and that which will lead to ultimate joy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. How about um, the spouse uh, uh, or the partner um, who's experienced this? What are some, some steps for healing for that betrayed partner? Oh, I may have misunderstood your first, your, your question first. Cause I think I gave that answer first. Oh, okay. 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 Th then let's go the other way around. So what would you say for the one who has the problematic behavior? For healing? Um, well, let's have some self-compassion. First, I want to say self-compassion, um, which you recognize that. And then, you know, do those things where we talked about going to the CSAT. Um, do your journaling. Do your um, meditation. Do the things that's going to put you in a place where when you may be triggered to have any of those behaviors, that you can be grounded enough to um, choose differently. Wonderful. That's great. That's great. Well, um, Tamara, you know, how, tell folks more about what you're doing, uh, what you, well, about your work and, and how they could get in touch with you. Okay, I am a betrayal trauma coach. I'm a CPCC, which means I'm the candidate, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I also have a certification. I'm a certified trauma support specialist through the Arizona Trauma Institute. And I'm working to get a get my certified resiliency professional certification. Um, and you can reach me at becomingshatterproof at gmail.com or becoming shatterproof.us that's my website okay. and that's that's me that's great well tamara i've really enjoyed talking with you and 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 uh discussing this really important subject with you thank you so much for the work you're doing and uh for being a part of the appsats community oh. <laughs> No, we're, we're, we're really glad that you came on, and, and I hope the best for you and, and uh, your practice, and I know you're going to help a lot of people. Thank you, Jay. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSAT. If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions, or comments about the show. Until next time, keep choosing to use your voice and live your values. It's good for you and for this world.